Hi, I'm Jacob Halbrun, the editor of the National Interest Magazine, and it is my pleasure today to host for our podcast on the Pumpkin Papers, Sam Tannenhaus, a longtime editor of the New York Times Book Review and the author of numerous books, including a seminal biography of Whitaker Chambers that was widely acclaimed when it appeared and remains a standard work. And since it is the 75th anniversary this past Saturday of the discovery of the pumpkin papers on Whitaker Chambers' farm in Maryland shortly after midnight, I thought I would ask Sam to talk to us about the history of the pumpkin papers their implications for Richard Nixon's career, and what significance the entire episode may have today for both conservatism and disputes about loyalty and patriotism in America. Sam, it was a came as a bombshell when the pumpkin papers were first discovered. Can you explain to us why they were so significant? Uh, Sure. First of all, hi, Jacob. Good to see you. Good to talk to you. Um, They were discovered, as you said, in December 1948. And discovered is probably not the best verb. Really um, revealed is more like it because Chambers had them for a long time. When Chambers, the ex-communist, defected from the party 10 years before the Hiss case in 1938, uh, as opposed to 48, He wanted to have what he called a life preserver, something that would protect him in the event that adversaries or enemies might try to do him harm because he was leaving the revolution. So he had to held on to the last batch of materials his State Department contact Alger Hiss had given him. There were typed documents and handwritten notes in Hiss's own hand uh, that summarized or reported on diplomatic cables and such, kind of classified, not the top secret, but nevertheless secret um, traffic, uh, code and cable traffic that was uh, traveling between State Department in the U.S. and Germany on the brink of World War II. So Chambers had all this material and gave it to a young relative who hid it away. And Chambers later said when the Hiss case began, he didn't say anything about documents he had. He said only that he had been a member of an underground cell. This was in a congressional hearing in the summer of 1948, the summer before the papers were divulged, and that his Confederates had included some high officials in government. Alger Hiss was one of them. Hiss was now, left the government, was now the president of the Carnegie Endowment. And as the allegations by Chambers were challenged by Hiss and Hiss alone, everyone else kind of kept quiet, all the other people Chambers had named, the uh, tension grew and the conflict escalated. And the very young congressman who was uh, heading the investigation, the House Committee on Un-American Activities, which we call HUAC, Richard Nixon, then all of 35 years old, uh, was pressuring Chambers to deliver more evidence that he'd been a very good and persuasive witness, but he had not produced documentary evidence. And people within the investigatory committee at UAC began to suspect Chambers was holding something back. Um, it was just a feeling that uh, investigators get when they get close to a witness that he wasn't telling them everything. He's not being fully forthcoming. So finally, uh, under pressure from the investigators, Nixon wasn't there. Chambers invited some of them to come out to his farm in Westminster, Minster, Maryland, sort of uh, you know near the Pennsylvania border, near Gettysburg, where he lived an hour or so, hour and a half from Washington. And he had on his, he led them out to a pumpkin patch. It was, it was late fall, it was, right? It was uh, practically winter and the fields were kind of frozen or frosted, but there were still some pumpkins on the vine or in a patch that he had. And he pulled one of them out and it had a carved top and he undid it. And there was microfilm inside it and this other documentation. And those are the famous pumpkin papers. Nixon knew nothing about this. He was on vacation and had to fly him back to Washington so he could commandeer the investigation and get all the credit 
for having broken the case wide open. And what that did was most important of all was to turn a case that had really been about whether people were secret communists, members of the party, enrolled or otherwise, turned from that into whether it had actually been spying, espionage. So it turned into a spy trial almost overnight. And that's the significance of the uh, documentation. And as far as uh, the pumpkin papers, as far as Nixon goes, another uh, one of the red hunters of that period, whose work you know very well, Martin Dyes, who had been the first chairman of HUAC, said Nixon was the only one who was able to take the anti-communist issue all the way up to the presidency, it really essentially become president because he'd done this thing. And we know, of course, later in Watergate, Nixon viewed that entire scandal, beginning with the Daniel Ellsberg papers, as being a kind of sequel to um, uh, the His Chambers case. And from that came all our mortal woe, or a lot of it, including your friend Henry Kissinger, who was there in the margins during Watergate. So it's a very big event, very dramatic, splashed in all the headlines. And there were actually the first really serious televised congressional hearings where the squat rumpled chambers being brought into confrontation with the tall, slim, you know, aristocratic seeming Alger Hiss. So it was great theater um, and important politics. It is remarkable, isn't it, that Nixon, who was only a first term congressman, was discerning enough to seize upon this immediately and ride it successfully, as you pointed out. Martin Dice formed the House on Un-American Activities Committee in 1938, when it was not even a standing committee. Franklin Roosevelt, as you well know, Sam, reviled the committee, as did Harold Ickes. It was developed by Dyes, who was a Texas congressman and a Democrat, also, yeah. a, also a member or favorable to the Ku Klux Klan, who was a virulently opposed to what he saw as the New Deal communism. He wanted to target liberals in the Roosevelt administration. Now, it, it took, it did take, what? It took almost a decade for anything to pan out, didn't it? Until then, the committee looked like stumble bumps. And Chambers thought they were too. Uh, Chambers had made earlier disclosures to uh, U.S. Navy intelligence uh, investigators and to a very high-ranking member of the State Department, Adolf Burley, after the begin the very beginnings of World War II, after the invasion of, of Poland, uh, Chambers had gone to them and uh, told them that uh, this underground uh, cell had been operating, uh, because this is only months after he left, in addition to which uh, Chambers thought it was important because he knew that the network he belonged to in the period leading up to World War II would, would now be, uh, because the Soviets and the Nazis were allies at this point, was really the pact, the, the Hitler-Stalin pact in 39 that frightened Chambers and some others, that the material that Hissen and uh, colleagues, Confederates, were giving to communists like Chambers would also make their way to Nazi Germany to the Russians because they were allies at this point, or so they feared. So it was kind of a big deal at that point. And as you say, Dyes is a Democrat. It's not really a, a partisan issue at that point. It's really more of a communist and anti-communist issue. It's not dissimilar to our politics today, where we see divisions that are more ideological or mythological sometimes, then they are strictly partisan differences. And then they spill over into the different parties. Dodge was a Democrat. Nixon was a self-described progressive Republican from California. But he did see that um, the enemies within, the secret communist conspirators, would be a very powerful way to shake up Washington, to build his own career. And he had the facts to prove it. That's what made him different from all the others. Right after Alger Hiss's conviction, in the second of two trials for perjury, for that is for having lied about what he'd done, not for the stealing of documents because of the statute of limitations and such. And by the way, as you know very well, the Truman 
administration, which was still in office, had considered indicting Chambers rather than his. After all, Chambers was the guy who came out and said he'd done it and had the documents. So in some ways it would be easier and more sensible to indict him rather than his. But that's where the political pressures came because there was an election that had just been held and uh, Truman had won, but there were already questions about loyalty and security in the State Department and elsewhere within the administration. So Truman had imposed a loyalty oath. So there was a lot of concern about holding the critics at bay or the detractors, or we'd say today, looking around at the way things look now, we'd say the insurrectionists at bay. Uh, They're the ones who were responding to the really kind of emotional passions uh, of the moment. So they decided they would indict Hiss instead. They have the two trials. Then after the second one, within a week and a half, I think it was, Joe McCarthy gave his famous speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, inventing, you know, lists of hundreds of communists still on the payroll. In this context, Jacob, interesting to consider, Hiss had already left the U.S. government. Why? He'd been pushed out. The rumors were already circulating. So they got him out. They moved him into a very powerful position, but it's still a non, you know, got an important job, still a non-government job at the Carnegie Endowment. There were numerous, well, as you say, there were questions about Hiss. One of the things that his defenders today say is that even if he did do it, these were venial sins, that the documents didn't really amount to a hill of beans, that uh, Hiss, in a sense, became uh, a martyr, that he was unfairly cast in the role of being a significant traitor. What's your assessment there? Yeah, I always found that a really difficult one. I never liked the word traitor. To me, that's, you know, Benedict Arnold, you know, conferring with with the other side. His, his had been an official at the Yalta summit in 1945. And later, the and I think you've written about this, the myth grew that Hiss had somehow controlled the events there. Roosevelt had been his puppet, and he had guided the U.S. into the arms of the Soviet Union. None of that was true. Hiss had also been the first Secretary General of the United Nations, which is one reason conservatives denounced it for many years to come. So a kind of mythology grew up around it that I do think is questionable. Now, Hiss's own loyalties or his ideological passions, I always found complicated. I think I wrote about this once uh, uh, many years ago when when, uh, after my book came out, but more documentation was emerging, that I think it was a matter of kind of conflicting loyalties. Uh, You could think you could be an operative in a a communist cell and think, well, you're advancing a very uh, honorable cause at in the late 1930s, before the the Soviet Nazi pact of who's standing up to the fascists that look like maybe the Soviets were. And in each case, you might make a kind of situational decision. Well, I'm not going to let them see these documents, but maybe these other documents will be helpful to them. And so I prefer, uh, like another uh, uh, colleague of ours, and I think a guest in your program, Barry Gouin, to set aside the really moral questions and look at them more in terms of kind of strategy and tactics and try to understand the positions people took when they did. And it's, I could see where many would say, whatever Hiss did, look at what Joe McCarthy over here is doing and ask yourself, which is worse. That became, in fact, the, the basis of that entire debate for many years to come. Um, it's, a, again, kind of parallel to our own politics of persecution. You know, who's being persecuted most? Is it pro-Israeli, pro-Zionist students at Columbia and Harvard, or is it pro-Palestinian students? And each one feels persecuted by the other. Each one feels the administration is not protecting them enough or giving a pass to the other one. What does this slogan mean? Is that a... a, a a a pro-Nazi slogan, or is it a pro-Palestinian slogan? And you end up with all these fights going back and forth that then become very useful ammunition for people who have agendas of their own. So I'm actually pretty sympathetic to that view that, well, do what the Brits did, you know, with Burgess and McLean and Kim Philby, just get them the hell out of there and don't make a big production of it, you know? But our system is transparency in these things. And, and uh, that's, or that's our habit 
as well as our system. So that's how we do it. Maybe pretension is the better word. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I want to zero in on you. You talked earlier about the the establishment angle to this, which was, of course, Chambers was this rumpled fatso with terrible teeth and hiss, a paragon of sartorial elegance, slim, tall, beautiful suits. But Murray Kempton pointed out that, in fact, to some degree, his is self-invented, isn't he? He comes from the same sort of shabby background that Chambers did. Isn't, yeah. isn't that an, an interesting angle that Kempton brings out? Yeah, that's a very brilliant essay uh, uh, Kempton wrote in his book, A Part of Our Time. It's interesting, uh, w William Buckley, who's a you know subject of my new book, uh, was very close to Chambers and Kempton. And when young people came to the staff at National Review, Buckley would have them read Kempton's chapter on Hiss and Chambers because he writes about the two of them. I remember when my book came out, which is now you know, a long time ago, I mean, 97, somebody, I think it was Russell Baker, who, whose uh, life and career you know very well, uh, was writing generally on the topic. And I think he was making an oblique reference to my book, but I don't really know. But what he said is, listen, all you really need to know about this case, Murray Kempton wrote back in 1955. And I think he's kind of right write about that. You know, there are aspects to add. And, and you know, I looked for them and did. And, and there's a story to tell, which I tried to tell. But I think Kempton got the essential thing right, that if you went back to that period in the late 1930s, a very fraught time, again, not so different from our own, you could see these intersecting passions and also kind of anxieties and ambitions. And you look at his and Chambers. Well, Chambers went to the Ivy League too, he went to Columbia. He dropped out, but he went there nevertheless. And of the two, it was uh, the critic Leslie Fiedler wrote about this uh, uh, literary critic as well at the time. Chambers was the brilliant one, not his. Chambers was one who, was, who spoke half a dozen languages, who read Dante in Italian, who translated uh, Heinrich Mann and Proust, you know. And so there was this idea as well that it wasn't just the establishment figure versus the uh, the fringe or figure, but New York culture versus Washington culture. Alan Weinstein, in his important book, Perjury, uh, which is very much about the case and which inspired me to write my book, uh, was adamant about that, uh, that if you looked at Chambers' world, it was the world of Columbia University and intellectuals, those famous writers, Lionel Trilling and, and Meyer Shapiro, all these people who've been Chambers' friends when he was very young, versus Hiss, the Washington guy. And of course, they both came from outside uh, their, their respective cities. Chambers was from Long Island. And his was from Baltimore. And so they were both provincials in a way. They were highly ambitious, aspirational provincials who came together at this historical moment. And, you know, that's what I try to describe in the book, too. But uh, but as usual, Murray got there first. He got there first about everything, by the way. And here's a oh, shout out to the was. Library of America. What are you going to do a Murray Kempton collection? Yes. Yeah, he was a brilliant. Uh, he was he was a great. Also, the other thing that I did, I drew, you know, he once wrote that you should always have sympathy for someone when they're down, even if they've done bad things. And I think I mean, I think he applied that to both his and I think he would have applied it to Nixon as well. I, I think he was a, it was a generous spirit. Oh, he did with Nixon. After one of his Kempton's children died, I think one of his sons, he got a condolence letter very affecting from Nixon, whom he'd never been kind to in print. Uh, it's in David Rednick's great profile of Murray Kempton in The New Yorker. I, I read it not long ago and uh, we read it. And Kempton said, well, how am I supposed to be mean to that guy in print anymore? And now I kind of feel bad that I had been before. And there's a very funny line he had to Buckley, who, again, was a great friend of his. He said, my God, I'm starting to feel sorry for Roy Cohn. You know, if you kicked if you kicked anybody hard enough, then Kempton would come around. And that is not a bad way to proceed. We could use a little more of that. 
very broad empathy. I think a number of uh, of the great journalists of that period had it, um, but Kempton was uh, was singular. So all to get our little Murray Kempton kick for a while because uh, he's been much on my mind. The younger writers who came up in that period, like Joan Didion and John Gregory Dunn, Gary Wills. Kempton was their hero. To this day, Gary Wills will always cite Kempton. Say Kempton always got it right. Kempton knew better than anybody else. Kempton thought harder, wrote better. And he wasn't even a syndicated columnist. You can go on newspapers.com, the great website, and find Kempton's columns because they were only in the newspapers he wrote for. He was very much a New York figure. That's one reason he's not so famous as then and certainly now as, as he ought to have been. I want to I want to pull us back to the to the establishment issue, whatever their backgrounds. And even if they were, in a sense, doppelgangers, it was a climactic clash, at least as as perceived publicly. Do you think that Hiss, as the epitome of the Eastern establishment, do you think that set the template for Richard Nixon's career? Did that cement his anger and resentment towards the establishment? Well, that's a very good point. Um, first of all, he did not hit it off at all with Hiss. He thought Hiss had been very insulting and insolent toward him when they first met in Huac. Remember, as you said before, Huac had a reputation for being kind of a tawdry, kind of, you know, low life uh, congressional committee. <laughs> you know, just imagine a committee run by Jim Jordan right now. Right. The committees we see run by someone like him. And that was the reputation Huac had. So when his came into the, co- uh, to the committee room, the only one of the uh, named or accused to come forward and deny, flatly deny the allegations of Chambers. His thought, uh, Cham- Nixon felt that his had been very insulting personally toward him and his manner and his style. And that was something that Nixon already had in him. You know, he came from that little town and in Orange County, he he was a brilliant student who'd, who'd been admitted to Harvard, but couldn't afford to go there, even with scholarships and those difficult times. And here was Hiss who had moved his way. Uh, it, Nixon, with a law degree from Duke, couldn't get a job in a Wall Street firm. And here is uh, Hiss kind of moving his way up, you know, up the ladder. So there was a personal animus. And then what Nixon said, he wrote me a letter about this, actually, um, that I quote in my book. Um, and I think Jack Farrell does in his Nixon biography as well, the same letter. Uh, Nixon talks about how the prestige media had sympathized with his and that gets you on the track to the alternative media we have today. So the prestige media would stick all the revolution uh, revelations back with the corset ads. I love but in that. this case, uh, in this case, Nixon was right, wasn't he? Well, he wasn't. He wasn't. Uh, he had one newspaper very much behind him, the New York Herald Tribune. And you could make the case that was the most establishment paper of them all, even more than the New York Times, because Nixon had been guided through much of the investigation uh, by a Washington journalist, Bert Andrews, whose work was getting on the front page of the Herald Tribune. So it was not quite so biased as Nixon said. In fact, if you roll back the Nixon history a little bit and you look at how he made the famous Checker speech in 1952, went on television, made the direct appeal to his voters and such. Why would he do that? He do that. He did that because he thought media actually treated him pretty well. He thought he did well on media and that he could summon uh, support. Nixon's coverage was not really that negative. Where it was critical was the New Yorker magazine or Harper's magazine. If you looked at the more elite, the smaller, more elite uh, journals, then uh, Nixon was was getting criticized more. But there were hardly attacks. Um, in addition uh, to which, if you keep that in mind, all right, so the magazines like The Nation or The New Republic or The New Yorker that are not being so kind to Nixon or seem to be sympathizing with the wrong side, well, that's how William Buckley and company come up with their own version. Well, remember, Herblock had the cartoon of Nixon crawling out of the sewer, out of the sewer. right? 
Yes, and that was a little later. You know, that was in the 50s. Right. It was after McCarthy had come. And I think that's what really got uh, what turned the coverage against Nixon was the rise of McCarthy and also Nixon's own campaigns. Nixon and campaign when he was first elected in 1946 uh, by calling his opponent kind of a, a fellow traveler when he ran for the Senate. In he called her pink down to her underwear. Yeah, against Helen Douglas, uh, Helen Gahagan Douglas. So Nixon was very much a rough house campaigner. And that's what really came back to haunt him. When he was actually doing the job, we'll call him as prosecutor, in the his case, he was actually very careful, uh, and very good. But it was that other thing that was always lurking in him. That's why there's so much great writing about Nixon. He's there, there's uh, he contained multitudes. He contained all the darker multitudes in in our politics. And so Nixon could be both things at once. He could be the brilliant foreign policy thinker and the brilliant strategist for for cornering Hiss and and showing him up, and at the same time resentfully denouncing all his critics. We you know we see this all the time. We're seeing a lot of it today. So are we reading history backwards if we say that, if I say that the Hiss case, as you pointed out, led to McCarthy or or gave, set the stage for McCarthy uh, in the Wheeling, West Virginia speech. And then you have an article by Jamel Bowie the other day claiming that the Nixon administration's contempt for democracy and the Constitution then led the path down to Trump? Or do you think that this is, do you think Trump is sui generis? Well, I would say, <laughs> my classic kind of answer, he's certainly sui generis, but those other things are true as well. I mean, uh, Nixon himself wanted to fire civil servants, as we know, and install his own uh, operatives uh, in what we what today is called the deep state or administrative state. He had a plan to do that. And it's, it's been written about. Um, he didn't trust anybody in the government bureaucracy, neither for that matter did Franklin Roosevelt or John F. Kennedy. That's why they always worked around them. You know, why does Kennedy have McGeorge Bundy in the White House deciding what the foreign policy, what this Harvard dean is going to decide where, where we fight the wars? That's well, because he didn't trust the State Department, didn't trust the CIA. All of that comes out of Kennedy and Nixon. Uh, Nixon didn't trust the CIA either. Um, and there are Nixon defenders now who think it was the CIA who kind of set him up in Watergate. You know, we've heard all this. Those, so my answer, Jacob, would be those are persistent strains in our politics. And it has to do, I think, with confusions about what we mean by our democracy. You know, critics of it or, or clever analysts like Calhoun, John Calhoun, were right about some things, right in the sense that our democracy can become what, what Frank Fukuyama calls a vetocracy. Minorities can actually dominate what happens in our government. They can, they can dictate the outcome of elections. We've seen this time and again. And the distrust of the institutional forces in the government is one that often makes a lot of sense. That's what gave us the anti-war protests in Vietnam was distrust of the Pentagon, distrust of the policymakers. It was the policymakers who gave us the Bay of Pigs, you know. Uh, Gary Wills wrote a brilliant book about the Kennedys, the Kennedy imprisonment, that says it all began with the Bay of Pigs. You can you can follow a whole line of of uh, of of cause and effect from the Bay of Pigs through the disasters of Vietnam. So. Um, I don't really have a problem. Uh, I don't really disagree with with those arguments. I think sometimes we tend to kind of valorize the institutions themselves as if there's something really impersonal about them when it's not really the case. You know, they reflect the people who staff them uh, and also the presidents uh, that, that work for. Remember when uh, Nixon fired Archibald Cox. It was the most respected uh, legal thinker in the country, uh, Alexander Bickel, who told, who said he, he has every right to do it. 
Um, Archibald Cox is working for the Justice Department. The Justice Department does actually report to the president. That's why when you look closely at the discussions now, where we talk about the autonomous Justice Department, the careful ones like the New York Times will always say, since Watergate, the attorney general has been assumed. Well, that means before then, he wasn't assumed to be um, a neutral actor. I have a theory, I'm not going to pursue it, I don't think, because it'll make me sound even crazier than I already do, that a lot of the trouble began when when John Kennedy appointed his brother to be the attorney general, his 35-year-old brother, who'd never been a judge, who'd never been even really a serious lawyer. He'd been an investigator for Joe McCarthy's own committees. And, and, and he's made the attorney general of the United States. It was denounced at the time as the worst sort of nepotism. We can say whatever we like about Donald Trump and his kids. I don't think he appointed any of his family to be the attorney general. And yes, that's I, for the next I, term, Sam. Yeah. The, I'm afraid there is a too long a history of all of these things. They keep resurfacing. You know, it's Freud's return of the repressed. They keep coming back. It's not as if they invented just now. You know, it's not happy uh, history, but but there it is. So since we're talking about the uh, the evolution of conservatism and the the effects, the, the conservative war on government, uh, you talk about it in your book, The Death of Conservatism, how the conservatives are revanchist, try to hijack the state for their own ends. Um, I'm wondering, I can't resist asking you what you think, if you've read it, of Robert Kagan's much touted new essay in the Washington Post, uh, where you, by the way, are now, I guess, a contributing editor to the to the book review. Uh, what do you think of his take that we are, in fact, sleepwalking into a new Caesarist dictatorship under Trump? Caesarism is the charge that conservatives used to hurl at, at, at Democratic presidents. Do you think Kagan has it right, or is he misreading what would happen under a Trump presidency? Well, uh, Kagan is a very interesting writer, but um, I take it all uh, with a, a grain of salt. In fact, I was just telling uh, one of our colleagues the other day that there is an essay I think you, Jacob Halbrin, ought to write called Second Thoughts on Robert Kagan, That is, th- which is the title of, a, of maybe the greatest essay George Orwell ever wrote. Uh, Christopher Hitchens told me he thought it was the single best thing Orwell ever wrote on the strategic thinker James Burnham. And what Orwell noticed in Burnham's writing, this piece was written in the mid-1940s, was that Burnham had a habit of looking at whatever was happening in the moment and melodramatically expanding on it in what sounds like an almost prophetic right? Prophetic detachment, warning of the dangers to come. And then six months later, when things look different, he finds a new thing to be catastrophic about. So with Kagan, I think, all right, we go back to that little book he wrote before the Iraq invasion, which he wholeheartedly supported, and without which, by the way, we might not have Donald Trump, and said, well, The world breaks down into two groups, right? There are the militarists like us in the U.S. who want to save the world. And then there are the wimps in Europe who don't want to. And then we go back, who are afraid of battle and conquest. Then we go back and look at it and we say, well, wait a minute. They just thought invading Iraq might be a bad idea. Why does that make them some kind of mythological force in the world? Maybe they were right about this. Well, so Kagan will write a book that says that, right? Well, I think I think what yes. you're talking about is a neocon apocalyptic mindset that is now being applied to U.S. domestic politics. Well, what Burnham, uh, what uh, Orwell saw in Burnham is what l- look like warnings about the dangers of power are actually kind of cultish. And you know, I think you write about this in in your new important new book, was actually a kind of transfixed cultish worship of power. Why is Kagan always telling us about these huge dire threats that can only be met with these huge dire counter 
actions, right? It's a world of fantasy. The fact is, if 50, right, and a half percent of the people vote for the Democrats, which they are thoroughly entitled to do, this might not happen, you know. Or, and I think Bob Kagan was right about this in, in the long piece, had Trump been in, convicted the first time he was impeached for obviously breaking the law. That was an even as clear an example of what the framers described as an impeachable offenses, secretly conspiring with a foreign power to undermine our politics. Uh, Hamilton himself could have scripted, the English would be much better, that conversation with Zelensky. Where were the Republicans then? Where was Liz Cheney then? Right. Where were the great prosecutors of January 6th then? And that comes from kind of inventing history at the moment to make the case you want to make. And I do think uh, we, we see a lot of that from neoconservatives, not only from them, see it from others, too, that you kind of look at the moment you're in and decide this is it. And all these big forces have converged and you blurt out some some uh, apocalyptic as you say, a pop apocalyptic scenario that gets people talking for a couple of weeks until the next apocalyptic scenario gets written. Now, if I may say so, Chambers himself was not immune to this impulse either, was he? You're not kidding. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. You know, Chambers is in my new book too, and in, in, in a different way, because Chambers was an Eisenhower Republican, which is kind of funny. He was the only member of that group who was a a, a kind of middle of the road Republican. And that's why he left National Review is because he liked Eisenhower and Nixon. Nixon had been his protector during the case. Now, this is long before Watergate, of course, but Chambers was also given to these apocalyptic utterances, right? The most famous one is, you know, we're leaving the losing side. He actually wrote world, you know, we're leaving the winning world for the losing world and all of this stuff because as some people, including uh, Jim Burnham, saw, Chambers was secretly still kind of a Bolshevik. There's this Bolshevik quality that he had. They all kind of had that. And, and now, that gets back to Kagan, too, doesn't it? He's saying essentially that he's he's afraid he's on the losing side. He's that we're sleepwalking into a new dictatorship. Isn't that? Yeah, it's funny. Doesn't that, Kessler have a book about sleepwalking through his the sleep uh, sleepwalking through history? Yes, I know that's the. Uh, um, it's really true. And the problem is no one comes out of it with with clean hands, because what I remember from the first Trump election in 2016 was when they, he went to South Carolina for the debate and accused Jeb Bush and his family and his administration, his brother's administration of having ponying up a, a war in Iraq. He said they said there were weapons of mass destruction, and there were none. Um, and he was right about that. And he won that primary. And Jeb Bush dropped out after that. In exactly. South well, who was behind that war? It was our Cassandra, you know, Robert Kagan was one of them. One, remember, I wrote a story, of, you know, all, all those years ago at Vanity Fair about Wolfowitz and some of these figures who were agitating for war there and was called, you know, every name in the book by people like, uh, uh, Bill Crystal and, and and others who were behind that war. Uh, the same thing, you know, accused of having distorted what Wolfowitz had told me in a taped interview and all of this stuff. And um, and and who was Wolfowitz? He was a guy who told me, you know, he was studying the possibility that Saddam Hussein had been behind the Oklahoma City bombing. I mean, the top policymaker saying this stuff. And that was, uh, you know this very well. You've written about them. You, you know, wrote the the book we have now on the neocons. Is, uh, they always know they're right. Um, and they're, you know, uh, remember someone said this at a conference you had. I think it, it might even have been the departed, as it were, Dimitri Symes himself, who said Nixon told him the neoconservatives are very good at argument, but maybe not so good at analysis. And I would say, yeah, Bob Kagan is a really good polemical writer. He has that melodramatic gift 
that Burnham had. He can get you all stirred up. He can gather his evidence and make you think, yes, we are walking uh, into a hellscape. Uh, we're, we're, we're three steps away from it, you know, and, and we have to act now, although we never really know what action we're supposed to take. We do remain a you know, uh, a democratic republic where where people vote and choose their representatives, good or ill. But it's a it's a kind of uh, poetic overstatement. Um, and I'm going to add one little thing, uh, uh, a piece I've been reading, I really recommend to viewers, listeners, is the great uh, literary critic Kenneth Burke many years ago, the beginning of the Cold War, I think it was 1947, gave a lecture, turned it into an essay on uh, ideology and myth and how what sounds like idea ideology is often really a kind of poetic myth making and um it's really worth reading i mean his writing could be a little naughty you have to un untangle a little a little bit but then it becomes really clear that the terms we use to talk about you know imminent dangers and and underbellies of of weak nations all of this is the language of poetry i mean not very good poetry but it's poetic language rather than strategic language and that's what i see in a lot of the uh this writing you're talking about it's 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 a mythography it's not really well, the, walter lecur said that many of the neoconservatives were frustrated english professors yeah, yeah, that's what I am too. By the way, he called it Shakespearean trauma. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, no, that's what that's what a lot of them are. Um, a lot but of there is the possibility, of course, that Bob Kagan is completely right, and that that would be a sobering one. Well, of course, there's a, the possibility is right. That's what makes it interesting. And 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 I welcome a piece like that. I don't mean to be uh, to disparage it. It's just I'd be a little careful, right? It, in, in just a uh, whole completely taking it in um, because people argue, they 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 uh, maneuver when they argue, they select uh, the information they, they give you and um, they want to be interesting writers. I mean, you know, I don't so much anymore, but I had those ambitions too once. I want to have my stuff read and argued and debated about by the, you know, the 11 people who think it's important and, and, and count whether seven of them like it or four of them and, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. But um, uh, so I think it is valuable. Uh, it's, it's good to have it there, but I'd be very careful about taking it too seriously because it, it is kind of you know this doom doom scrolling that people do on their phones it's kind of entered into the into the culture in a in a general way that's why i like people like kempton who just kind of tell you what somebody said or they uh, kempton was a terrible interviewer by the way he said he could never interview anybody but he'd always walk around and follow them he'd look at them and see what they said somewhere and, and what the setting was like and just describe it for you um and i think that in the end is probably more useful helpful so, Sam, as a final question, I'd like to ask you, if Trump becomes elected, one of the things he wanted to do in his uh, first term as president was to create a garden of American heroes on the National Mall. I'd forgotten that. And I assume that if Trump were to become president again in 2024, if he wins election against Joe Biden, that he would uh, resume his ambitions to create this garden. Do you think that one of the people in that garden should be Whitaker Chambers? Wow, Trump's garden. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, actually, I don't think I'd, I'd put him in a garden of heroes. I think he belongs more since we're talking about poetry. It's more in that uh, that Marianne Moore poem about the, the real toads in imaginary gardens. Um, Chambers, in a way that I identify with, so I do not say this in disparagement, you know, talk about the rumpled, you know, versus the elegant and the short and squat versus the tall and slim. Well, we all know where I fit there. So I'd say more that he's kind of a memorable toad, and we ought to have more toads on display. Uh, toad and also uh, a hedgehog, you know, in that, uh, that Isaiah Berlin formulation, you know. Chambers was a guy who got one big thing right. And that's important. Uh, but I don't think uh, making a hero of him is really the answer. No, he um, is the hero for conservatives, even down to today. Yeah, I mean, he's in. Well, you know, it's interesting. I uh, uh, at an event I did, which I think you attended a zillion years ago. It was, it was at the old executive office building during the yes, Jewish yeah, Bush the, administration. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, I remember 
Robert Novak came out there and said, whatever his flaws, Richard Nixon stood up to the liberal elite and, and as you put it, got the one big thing right, defending Alger, defending Whitaker Chambers, targeting Alger Hiss, and unmasking the communist conspiracy in the Roosevelt administration. Well, what I remember, I uh, it's funny, I don't remember his saying that, though you have told me since that's what he said, and I don't deny, I don't doubt it for a moment. What I remember is that Robert Bork was there, Judge Bork, as everyone always called him. And uh, he was in the elevator, I think. And um, he said, uh, so what are you doing now? And I said, uh, well, I'm doing William Buckley. And he said, Bill Buckley? How can you go from Whitaker Chambers to Bill Buckley? And I was really surprised by that because Buckley had been one of Bork's champions. In fact, uh, when Reagan was elected, I have this in the book, so I'll little, divulge a little thing here. Um, Buckley was very close to Reagan, of course, and to the group around him, to his kitchen cabinet in Los Angeles, one of whom was Alfred Bloomingdale. They were big friends of the Reagans. And Buckley, uh, Bill belonged to uh, the Bohemian Grove. He went there every summer and saw Bloomingdale and other people there. So they asked him to recommend people for various jobs. And Buckley recommended Robert Bork for the Supreme Court, uh, which was not surprising. His name had come up before. He also recommended Gene Kirkpatrick for a job in the State Department. They wanted Buckley to take the job that she ended up with, which was a UN ambassador. But uh, he thought very highly of, of Bork. You know, Bork was a Yale guy and protege of, of Bickle and, and uh, you know, was was an interesting, sort of brilliant guy, I have found, um, though also you know, extreme in his views, to put it mildly. But um, but he was surprised at somebody who wrote about the great Whitaker Chambers, the, the great moral force would now turn to Buckley when, to me, I think in historical terms, Buckley's far more important than Chambers. Chambers has, is is meaningful. It was meaningful to me. You know, I spent years learning about him and thinking and writing about him. And as I say, I have some new material information on him in this book, in the new book. But, um, but I don't know how great the broader impact was. I think people like us who uh, journalists and and failed academics, whatever we are, who live in the world of arguments and ideas and debates, tend to inflate other writers. It's a natural thing. You know, um, somebody said, uh, you know, uh, Moby Dick is the greatest book of its time. So for me, Melville is the greatest man. And I totally get that. I mean, I'm kind of of that party myself. But if you try to take the broader view, you think, well, you know, was Chambers really more important than Roy Cohn? Was he more important than Joe McCarthy? Well, depends, you know, what you're looking at. I do think McCarthy was the key figure here. Um, he's really important. And Nixon and McCarthy had a complicated relationship. Nixon kind of outmaneuvered McCarthy early on. And he saw he saw the dangers and threats. But because of that, Nixon was never trusted by the right. They thought he was too much a kind of errand boy for for Eisenhower when Eisenhower clashed with McCarthy. So they he always had to prove that he that he was really one of them. I think, uh, Buckley has a piece, very interesting piece essay he wrote in the Time, New York Times Magazine, shortly into Nixon's administration, and it's, it's a, the headline is something: like, "Is he one of us?" Is Nixon really one of us? Meaning was Nixon, like Reagan and Goldwater, a true conservative? And the answer was he really wasn't. We also know that's true of Trump. And so that's why a lot of the, the criticism from the right is, always, well, he's not really a conservative. And I'm thinking, OK, <laughs> so what? You know? Who is? Who is? And who even knows what a conservative is. By the way, when you ask about conservatism, there's something Gary Wills does. And Wills, you know, was a just a, a load star to me at the age, almost of 90, still writing. Um, and he seldom uses the word conservatism. He uses the word conservative and conservatives. And I think he's right because it's not an ism. It's more of a kind of state of mind or a set of attitudes or beliefs that you hold at a particular moment. It's not an ideology. I get a lot of emails from something called freedom conservatives. Have you seen this? They call themselves freedom. And I'm thinking, well, what does that mean exactly? You think, are the, are the other ones enslavement conservatives? You know, I, I, don't, I don't know what they're saying, except that they're kind of throwing slogans around. There's a lot of sloganeering 
that goes on in our politics that's presented as uh, as principles. I found with Buckley, for example, he changed his mind all the time. You know, he hated powerful presidents, as you said. Burnham and Chambers and the others talked about Caesarism. That was a term that later became the imperial presidency. Well, when Arthur Schlesinger, who liked powerful presidents, JFK and FDR, found two he didn't like, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, then he's concerned about imperial presidents. When the critics of Caesarism, like James Burnham and Bill Buckley, find a conservative, a right-wing president they like, then they're all for a powerful unitary executive. You know, these things happen all the time. Happens with race. Uh, Well, first, there's a concern that uh, if you open up the vote to, uh, to Southern Blacks, Then you will have this huge block that might defeat, you know, God's own segregationists for office. And then when there's a backlash against civil rights, you say, well, what about protecting the rights of of the white majority or the same thing in South Africa? South Africa discussed in terms then that sound a little bit like the way Israel's being discussed today. These are the these are the people who are holding civilization together. You know, who cares what happens to those other ones? And it, it so the, the themes repeat themselves, the slogans, the patterns that happen over and over again. And I think um, we put, we kind of glorify them with ideological terms that I think come closer to uh, a Kenneth Burke's idea of really myths that we subscribe to, like origin myths. What's the true beginning of the country? Mike Lind has been writing, our friend Mike Lind has been writing, interestingly, about this fetish we have for the framers and founders. You know, they barely got their constitution through, you know, already resistance was building. Um, and and it never went away. You know, Madison and and Jefferson were already working on you know interposition amendments and you know secret protocols. As soon as John Adams took office, this kind of pretense that it's a scripture that we read like the Bible and all of this stuff. These are fantasies we tell ourselves. Sure, but every nation needs its myths as well. Well, you know that's what they say. That's what Gordon Wood said. Um, and I wonder. I suppose we do. We all do. Even even the Federal Republic of Germany today. You know they have their founding myth after World War II, France, the British. I, I think it's a constituent element of any modern nation. Yeah, it, it could be. It could be. I wonder, I'm curious, and you know so much about Germany. Is it part of the discussion in the same way? Um, no, like- there isn't the same. I mean, the United States is somewhat peculiar in the reverence that it pays to the founding fathers. I mean, people don't go around hailing Conrad Adenauer in Germany. There's, there is something fetishistic about it in the US, but maybe it's because our leaders since them have, have never been as eloquent. Well, you had Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah. uh, But I don't know. There is, there is some peculiar insecurity, even a neurosis in America. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned Adenauer. Well, there's somebody who's emerging after that long history they've had, which took them in a, in a very frightening and, and destructive place. And we have to insist this. You come back to to Burke that it's the true origin. It's where the country begins. It's our founding, you know, and um, it it does give you pause. It, um, it for instance, I've never understood, you know, the originalism argument, the basis of that, what they used to call the original understanding, right? Isn't that what, what Bork and, and Scalia called it? I think Bork called it the original understanding, and then Scalia one-upped him by calling it the original meaning. I think this is in James Rosen's book, a very interesting book, you know, he has on Scalia. And Scalia outwitted him by calling it the original meaning. And he sort of got tapped for the Supreme Court because Bork had a, like, a little too much intellectual seriousness to go that far. And now we have the text dualism. Talk about failed English professors. Now everybody's turned into Clayent Brooks, you know, re- reading, you know, the hidden ironic meanings, you know, of uh, of, of poems by, by George Herbert and John Donne, you know, only now it's it's our, our founders and framers. And there's a lot of that around. And you just wonder 
When was the moment when it was really seriously questioned? You know, Vermeule at Harvard, who's about as far right wing as you can get, is extremely critical of the originalism. Sure. And he quotes the leftist Ronald Dworkin showing how uh, vacuous it is. He quotes. Well, maybe Dworkin. maybe we do live in a different time than Chambers, where the ideological boundaries have are have been are more of a, a washing machine today. Oh, washing machine. That's interesting. So what do you mean? You mean everything gets thrown in? Yes, everything's tumbled. Right. Yeah, I think so. I think they have become kind of buzzwordy. That's why it's interesting to follow Trump that way. And one more thing about him. We're going on much too long here. The most obvious reason that Trump is winning by so much in the, uh, you know, for the Republican nomination, and we haven't had you know, obviously any actual contest yet, is he's by far the most adroit candidate. And, he's also and the I, most authentic. Well, uh, yes, he's certainly the most authentic, but he's also the most skilled, I think. For instance, uh, if you look, and I think Kagan does say this, he's enormously skilled. Like if you, he got on to the persecution theme very early. He, remember, we don't, we no longer talk about grievance. Remember, it was all grievance for a while. Now it's shifted to persecution. And Trump got on that more than a year ago. He's, he, uh, he, that was his word. Also, if you look at how he tests and tries out concepts and then abandons them like he doesn't say woke anymore because he knows nobody really knows what it means if you get out to the electorate where people cast votes they have no clue what you're talking about so let's just, face it he is a non bibulous version of joseph mccarthy he has a yeah he has a lot of uh mccarthy skills yeah you know bill buckley remained loyal to joe mccarthy to the end you know that that is the thread of the conservative movement that we can trace it's not the conservative movement but it's a con it's an important element of it from yeah the, well, you, from are, the, you, you have this in your book right i mean there's a lot of mccarthy in your book right yeah, yeah mccarthy was the one they needed a populist you cannot do what these people want the ideologues and the and the Ma the would be Machiavellis, unless they've got their kind of truncheon wielding populist prince. And uh, McCarthy was the first one who came along. You had figures like uh, Father Coughlin and Huey Long, but they're kind of outside of politics. There, are, I mean, Coughlin got the media part of it very well, but and Huey Long's really sort of on the left. They they can't work with them. But McCarthy gets right inside and starts blowing it up from within. And they saw this guy knows what he's doing. And the one who taught Buckley that, as you know, was his Yale professor Wilmore Kendall. He's the one who said, you know, what we want is a vigilante. That's what we're looking for. Uh, we're really looking for vigilantes who will come in and kind of, you know, tar and feather them, like in that early great Nathaniel Hawthorne story, um, you know, and drive them out of the village. That's what we're really looking for. And uh, and McCarthy's the guy who'll do it because he'll say anything. He'll say anything. Go after anybody. Right. And um, and then they think, OK, this guy we could really get somewhere with. And with Lindbergh couldn't do it either. Lindbergh was too kind of remote and genteel and, and had too much self-respect. But McCarthy, um, then George Wallace came along and that was a narrower thing. He was also too much a New Deal populist for them. But McCarthy gets them closer. Um, then Trump comes along. Uh, Sarah Palin was their kind of placeholder. Then Trump comes along and he has that kind of brashness and the aspirational thing that so other people look at him and say, yeah, if I had a if I had a billion bucks, I'd get a gold plated Rolls Royce, Royce and get the biggest the biggest Mac McDonald's has got on the house. And I bring them all back. You know, I get the triple milkshake. Right. And uh, and all this stuff. And you think, yeah, that's what Trump does. You know, like that's the way a rich guy does it. A rich guy walks there a lot, you know, doesn't pay his bills, but he gives out the hundred dollar, you know, tips to the to the uh, caddies and the groomsmen at the golf course. And that's how you do it. You know, and it's a very American thing. Early on, Chambers said to Buckley, you know, I don't understand why they're calling him this kind of foreign fascist. No, he's a very American type, you know, and Trump has that, too, is, uh, well, comes, you know, right yes, means and absolutely. Sam, to use a WFB word, this was an enormously fructifying conversation. <laughs> is anyone who has still made it to the end of this podcast will be able to discern that we could go on 
for another seven to eight hours, and in fact, often have in, the, <laughs> in a private capacity. Yes. So I would like to thank Sam, who has a very important new book coming out on William F. Buckley this fall from- Fall of Rand 2024. Fall of 24 from uh, Random House. And it's been eagerly anticipated. And uh, I would, again, I'm very grateful to Sam for coming on this podcast. And- uh, sharing his capacious knowledge of all of these events. And I guess I should personally thank him here as well. He's someone, if I can may say so, who has uh, stimulated and helped inform my thoughts on American politics and conservatism for several decades now. Thank you again. That's a way of saying we, we've, we've had a lot of drinks together. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Jacob. My pleasure.